Hello and welcome to the Swan Song Project podcast. The Swan Song Project is a charity that helps people faith and end of their lives or dealing with bereavement to write and record their own original songs. We believe in celebrating lives, making memories and leaving legacies. My name is Ben Buddy Slack and I'm the founder of the Swan Song Project and the host of this podcast. The podcast features songwriters. We talk about one of their songs, ask them for a songwriting tip and I also ask them for a song that's meaningful to them in some way related to bereavement. This is episode 50 and it's a very special episode featuring the great Chip Taylor. Chip Taylor is a real legend of songwriting. He's written songs covered by Jimi Hendrix, by Chrissy Hyde, by Emily Lou Harris, by Willie Nelson, by Johnny Cash. The list goes on and on of people who've covered Chip's work. Um, some of his most famous ones are Wild Thing and Angel of the Morning. They're both huge hits. Um, and he's just, he's, he has been here with mine for a long time. So I was very chuffed to get him on the podcast. And I was a bit starstruck through a lot of it, I think. But he gave, he's such a nice man as well. And he gave him so much wisdom. And he talks about lots of these great songs that he's written over the years. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. It's episode 50 featuring Chip Taylor. Okay, today I'm here with Mr. Chip Taylor. Thanks for joining me, Chip. Nice to be here, Ben. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. I've been a big fan for a long time. Um, Chip is uh, songwriting royalty in, uh, in this world, so it's a real honor. And this is episode 50 of the Swan Song Project podcast, so it feels very special to have uh, have you here for it. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for your time. So if anyone's listened to or seen these podcasts before, you'll know we do them in three sections. First, we're going to have one of my guest songs. Uh, we're actually going to have two of Chip's songs in this episode, because it's a special one. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how he wrote them. Section two, we're going to talk about, um, we'll ask Chip for a songwriting tip. It might be useful for other songwriters. And then section three, we're going to talk about songs meaningful to Chip in some way related to bereavement. So I'll ask you to introduce your first song for us, please, Chip, that we're going to talk about. Ben, this is a song, uh, it's one of my favorite little songs. It's on an album I had called Whiskey Salesman a couple of years ago. And uh, it was a real simple song. I, I write real simple songs often. Um, and it was inspired by a, a trip I took with my wife to uh, to Florida. I actually was not on tour. I was going to Florida to watch a golf tournament. But after I came back, I, I was just thinking about it in my apartment. And uh, how, what a blessing not only the trip was to meet the people we went to see, but half of this blessing was really just being with my wife, Joan, going through the airports and sitting next to her uh, on the airplane. It was uh, a very nice, uh, warm feeling. So it was, this song just came out very easily, and I liked it very much in its simplicity. I often like things in their simplicity, mm-hmm. you know, just something that gets to me. It happened mm-hmm. to be sent to the um, festival that, uh, what was it? The, oh, I don't know. Some kind of festival that honors... Uh, Travel, the traveling festival oh, nice. in some exotic place, which I was not able to attend, and then it became the runner-up to the winner. So we were in the top three. Yeah. I 
I like riding, sitting next to you on a train. I don't care where we're coming from if I'm next to you. Here comes the sun. I like riding, sitting next to you on a plane. Okay, brilliant. So that was I Like Riding by Chip Taylor, the album Whiskey Salesman. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. Um, and I really like when you were talking about it then, it's the, and you're saying about liking to write simple songs, that simple songs are often the hardest ones to write. And I think that having that awareness of, um, you know, this is just a beautiful thing, traveling with your wife and just and the excitement of going through the airport and, and then being able to capture that in, in such a beautiful way. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, like you said, the songs, some of the simpler songs might be the hardest right to write. To me, the simplest ones, uh, as long as I'm focusing in this, like I wasn't trying to write a song that day when I played I Like Right, and I was, you know, I was, I was just playing the guitar and you know, it felt good. That's the start of everything to me, is that something feel good. So I was going, you know, I like riding, sitting next to you, all the fun. And I just started laughing about something. That's so nice and so simple. I thought, how can I make it any simpler? I like riding, sitting next to you on the train. Anyway, so that was pretty simple, those two lines. And then I don't care where we're going or something like that, just as long as we're sitting together. So that uh, that's, I really got to chill when I. When I write, I always guide myself then with looking for chills. Mm. And it's simple, you know, I don't have to be clever with myself to get a chill. The simplest things can give me a chill. And uh, so basically, that's how I've always written. Ever since I was a little kid, I try to get the feelings out. Not, I don't think of things to write about, ever. Maybe once in a while, I wrote a song called Storybook Children, where I saw two little a boy, little black boy, little white girl walking across the field, and I couldn't wait to get to the place where I could start working and writing a song, and, and that became the first black and white hit in the United States, Storybook Children, and the first group to ever play the Apollo Theater. That was back in the late 80s. But that is one song I did have a vision of something that, transferred to me that I put on paper. Most of the time, I'm just letting my mind go blank and seeing what's coming up and if something comes up that ooh, makes me feel a little something, I keep, <laughs> I keep going. That's a great way to do it because you're very prolific as well, aren't you? You write a lot of songs. Uh, you brought, you've brought out a couple of albums this year already, haven't you? I'm um, sorry? You've brought out a couple of albums this year already, yeah. haven't you? Yeah, you know, and it was, people were saying, how, how are you doing in the lockdown? Well, mm -hmm. we stayed locked down. And uh, I'm in my, uh, it was a nice place to work. Normally I was living in New York City. And since the lockdown, I came up, Joan, my wife and I have been living up in Westchester County. And I have a little living room and I have a little piano there, which I don't play much of. And I have a, a microphone, like there's my microphone that I use for all my recording. And I just play the tracks in here and send them by wire to my producer in, in Norway, and my co-producer and friend, Joran Green. And he, I give him edit points and he edits them together and sends it back to me and does some work on it. And, and it was so much fun. I would talk to him on Skype every day, every, every other day about what I sent. And, and he would talk to me about what he was thinking of doing with it. And, uh, not only did it pass the time in a nice way, but uh, the songs were generated, probably those songs. That was an, an album called New York to Norway and Back. And the songs were <clears throat> mostly generated from my, the spirit of being 
of what we were all going through with the COVID. Mm. And I lost a few people. And uh, after I finished the album, there's one my friend John Fine, who we'll talk about later, uh, passed away from me. But the whole spirit of Neil Tanoa and back was in that kind of spirit. Uh, mm. And the songs were written the same manner, not trying to write anything particular, just letting some emotion come out. And then I had the album out, Dad and the Monkey, which was written a little bit in the same spirit. Started just before the, the lockdown and finished while we were locked down. So really nothing has stopped me here. I feel blessed that I'm able to continue working. Do you write, you're writing pretty much all the time. Do you, and is, does it feel like work for you still? Or is it like you said you just like doing it and you just come up with songs and then it's a bonus that it's work for you as well? Um, I wouldn't say I'm writing all the time. <clears throat> I'm either listening to what the music, what Joran sent back to me and making notes and about arrangements and stuff like that, but basically I don't leave them alone. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's something to do with music every day. Most of the time it's half and half, maybe listening to a track that Joran sent me, making notes on that and then spending a couple of hours with my guitar to see if anything comes out. Once in a while I'd write on the piano and I'll just play that. And, and not, I'm not hunting for something to say. And if I think, if I get the feeling that I am, then if I'm working too hard at it, then my, if my brain is trying to force me someplace, I usually slow down. I'd say that maybe you've been doing too much of this, you know. Okay. Like a couple of days, but not too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does it? Um, do you have a set? Like, do songs vary in how long they take you? And like, do they often come, um, like, nearly fully formed, or do you? How often do you? Like, how long does it take you to write songs generally? Does it vary a lot? That's a good question. Uh, I would say, for the most part, it may take the spark a little while to get there. And then uh, after the spark comes, the song comes pretty quickly. Mm. And uh, I know I, I try to keep, I, as I mentioned to you, I try to keep my brain out of it as much as possible. But then at the end of it, I might try to say, well, maybe that word fits a little better this way or something like that. But I, I'll give you an example of how powerful songs are to me. Uh, this. That's it. No, I don't know where I did it. But um, I, I came downstairs the other night. I was playing. I'm going to play you a song nobody's heard. It's brand new. I haven't recorded it. Oh, wow. Exclusive. Uh, <laughs> and I was trying to write a song. And and I was my feeling was it, it was... It was Something on the guitar was coming, but it really wasn't coming. So I let whatever was coming into my brain. What was coming was I was trying to write a song. It wasn't coming. That was there. So I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> so that this, this song did come out of the not of a song not coming. <laughs> and the song goes like this. I just came by to say goodnight again. I had gone downstairs to write a song Catch some words from heaven, but the song it never appeared. But your smile kept sneaking in, and I came back to say good night again. That sounds like a little, <laughs> almost like an Elvis. Uh, That's beautiful, Chip. Yeah, <laughs> but it's just it's and it's so unusual because I never heard a song like that. Yeah, and I just try to write something. 
wasn't working, but the one thing you kept thinking about was your smile. And just wanted to come up and, and uh, the next verse says, I, I just came back to kiss your lips again. And it's just a sweet little song. Yeah, I think it's that, it's that beautiful. It's and I'll tell you what I, I would say this about songs. If they're those kind of sweet songs that you write very personally, even if they're not what you would call probably not a hit, I don't think in terms of hits, mm. even though probably this is my most successful time in a long time of having songs that are very getting, you would call them hits, they're, they're pretty big. But I don't think in terms of that, and probably most of my songs are not like that, but the reward that I get from my song, that, like for example, yet last night, I just played you that little song. I wrote that a couple of days ago. And I sent it to Yoron, and he sent me some little stuff back playing piano on it. And I was up, last night I was upstairs, when night before that, and I just was feeling not good. And, and I was feeling very tense. And I wasn't feeling one with, I don't know what was bothering me. I don't want to get into that, uh, but something was bothering me. I wasn't being such a nice guy. I was, you know, tough to deal with, I think, which I am often. <laughs> and, uh, so I came downstairs and I, and I came downstairs and Yoren had just sent me some mixes of that song and another brand new song. And I played the mixes. And I said, oh, my God. My whole body. So here is just writing this song, how simple the song is, about some simple thing that when I heard it back playing to me, it felt so honest and filled with love. And it made lifted my whole spirit. I started out this kind of edgy person, not dealing with the moment very well, listening to the songs come back to me and feeling so within my own heart and loving my wife so much. And I just had to go up and, and bring my guitar up and sing that to her and uh, uh, tell her how good I felt when she was glad I was feeling good hard to deal with somebody who's not yeah <laughs> that's beautiful yeah it's it's so powerful i think i think it's something that you definitely you know are sort of really great at is you like to say capturing those small moments and i think that's what um music is so so powerful for when it can capture those and like I say so specific things where a certain feeling and a certain something else a very specific feeling will just connect with you and can really lift your mood and and relate to it. it's um and I think it's like for me, I kind of, I, I, I've done that in the past where I feel like I've had a song where it's just come through me and it's like, you know, about a very specific thing and I've just allowed it to come through. But a lot of time I, I kind of overthink the songs, I think, and then I get a bit stuck with trying to write them. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's, it, feels, it feels like it should be easy to write this, you know, to just channel it and, and go like that. But it's so, it's so easy to overthink things. Um, and stories like that are really good reminders of how powerful those, letting those songs happen. Um, yeah. how powerful I mean, they are. Even think about <clears throat> some of my biggest hits have been so simple. And so, a silence pay, plays a big part in my songs. Mm. Not saying something for a while. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <and clears throat> like even a song like Wild Thing, and I don't mind playing Wild Thing. It's, a, it's not like something that I... I play usually play it every night in some kind of spirit. Mm. And one of the things I love about Wild Thing, it has makes everybody move a little bit. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember getting an example of that in, in above Milan, uh, at Lake Maggiore. There was a couple of little kids, like five years old, with their mothers hanging onto their mother's coat, but their mothers were interested in themselves talking to each other. And the little kids heard me on the side of the thing, and I looked at them. So I just started playing the, the grooves to Wild Thing, and I and the, and I was watching the kids. So I went, and 
and they started just going. <laughs> and they slowly left their mothers and started coming over by the guitar, you know, and that was kind of nice, you know. And then, and when you think of a, a wild thing, there's just communication between two people. Wild thing, man. Thank God. But I want to know for sure. There's a lot of space in there. Giving yeah. me chills, Chip. <laughs> When I was so happy that Jimi Hendrix was, was playing it. He yeah. Was, he was over in the UK and he was nobody. When I had met him, he was in the game, <laughs> struggling to write a song, any, any way to get in the business. And then a couple of months later, he was in the UK. And uh, as the word had, had it, he was with his girlfriend, Jane. And he, like the little kids, heard me play a wild thing and it meant something to him. It just meant them feel good. That's what it meant. And so Jimmy heard the Tribes record on the radio and uh, told Jane about it. He said, Jane, I just heard the record. My favorite record. So I got to sing that song. In the morning, next morning, it played when he was in the shower. When he jumped out of the shower, quite naked, he said, that's the one. And I have to sing that song. Here's the cool J J Jimmy Hendrix singing a song that was at the time heading for the top of the pop charts in England, <laughs> and he didn't care. <laughs> How did that feel when having Jimi Hendrix cover one of your songs? Well, it was kind of scary when they gave, they showed me the private screening of him, Monterey, burning his guitar, and <laughs> the sacrifice thing like that. But I loved, I loved that he felt it, you know, the way I felt it, because, you know, you could say, when you play three chords, the reason my chords play the way they play, now that's not because I'm good at it. That's because I, I'm not good at it. That's because I never got a lesson. So I don't, I didn't play it. That's what I played if I had a lesson. But because I didn't know what I was doing, I was trying to get to the other chord. My thumb did something funny, and it kind of slid to the other chord. So here, yeah. you know, so it's like something. And I, when I, I played some shows with Bill Frizzell, you know, the, the, the great Bill Frizzell, can you imagine, the greatest guitar player in the world? Me. And he came over to me after we recorded one song. He said, can you play the guitar for me? Do it slowly so I can see what you're doing. <laughs> he wanted to see how I strummed, what my thumb did and stuff like that. And I, the only reason I did that was because I didn't have a pick. I never learned the use of a pick. So I had to make the kind of movement. So I did it a different way with my hand. So I was blessed to have that in all my songs, Angel of the Morning and everything. has that little thing that I wouldn't mm. have done. You know, it's almost a percussive sound. That's a great piece of advice, I think, for young musicians that lots of things that they might try and teach you out of um, can become. I think it's a great piece of advice for young musicians that, you know, things that, you might not be taught how to do, but you might pick up when you're playing yourself can become real signatures of your style that really, really make your songs a bit distinctive. That's right. If you can get to the chord some way, you know, and it sounds a little funny to you, you got there a little differently, well, kind of appreciate your, that your, that path that you took and see if there's anything magical in it. Yeah. <laughs> it might be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. You know, it's like it's like in the you know you see, like Angel of the Morning was uh, mm -hmm. 
I'm using some ticking on it. This is here I am after all these years. I never ever ticked. <laughs> now I can now because of lockdown I do a little extra things <laughs> with my fingers. You know? but there'll be no strings to bind your hands. Not if my love can find you. The way those chords are kind of played in beautiful silence. Mm -hmm. There's no need to take a stand. It was I who chose to stand. Now, if you just if you switch it, if you went, wow. Same feel, mm. same guy. You played everything. That's my signature, whatever that was. So, well, it, there's nothing. There's nothing fancy there, but it, it, it is something that became, you know, a lot of what what made some nice. And the way, like, and the way other artists might have interpreted that, they try to do that. They try to. Mm copy it to get it, which I'm glad of. But Jimmy with Wild Thing, he just the tribes got it perfectly from the demo that I sent them. The strum was the same. And Jimmy did the strum exactly like that. And, uh, so. Had you written Wild Thing for yourself to perform or had you written it for the tribes? No, you know, back then I was assigned staff writer. And ah. I I had come from the country. I, I was writing I'm from New York area. But I, I was writing country songs. I had a country band. And some of those songs, then I decided I wanted to try to sell them to publishers. And a couple of publishers took a song or two and sent it to different people. And all of a sudden, Chet Atkins, the brilliant Chet Atkins, the guitar player, was the head of RCA Victory. And he heard some of my songs. I can't, as I'm cutting that song you, you said, just sent down, Jerry, the, the, the publisher. He said, I have no idea who Chip Taylor is, and it is very hard for me to believe he's from New York. But wherever he's from, I want to hear every song he writes. And so he started recording everything I sent out. And they were just real simple little country songs. And uh, so I had a hit with Bobby Bear, and Willie Nelson recorded one of my songs. Later on, Waylon Jennings did, Johnny Cash did. So they were all my heroes. They all recorded a song. But, uh, was getting into the business, and I was the only country writer in New York, uh, and I was having success at it. But then the influence of the city and blues and stuff like that made me start to write some rock and roll songs, and then uh, that led me to Wild Thing and Angel of the Mornings, and some rhythm and blues hits. One the tribes also did, which is one of my favorites. Uh, Any way that you want me, mm -hmm. a wonderful record by Spiritual Eyes performance, you know? and a big hit by Evie Sands finally did it. So, but that's another song that's just like such. It's such a. I just learned a new chord that day. I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I learned that chord. Now you probably knew that chord. Like, <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but I, I didn't know. the sound of it. Yeah. And if it's love that, if it's love that you want, hey, babe, you got it. From the depths of my soul. That to me, that's the really magic chord. Mm. Not trying to say anything fancy other than "baby, you got it." Yeah, repeating the same thing it doesn't make any difference if you repeat something you repeat it. So what? You get your point, but go home. You know? Yeah. And then, then the song. Went, <laughs> and I don't think that you gave up the love. To explain any way that you want, and 
nice drum again. So, I was just fortunate to be in, to not have ever had a lesson. Because <laughs> that, that groove is uh, many of my hit songs that, that the way I play is part of it. That's and really the people good. that recorded the records did, for the most part, a good job of trying to. I, I can picture it really great guitar players. Like, what the heck is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing career you've had, Chip. Is there, this is quite, might be quite a tough question, but is there a particular um, cover of one of your songs that is you know, extra special to you? Obviously, you've had, like you mentioned, so many of your heroes have covered your songs. Is there any particular one that really stands out to you as being extra uh, meaningful? Uh, I've had so many, really. So many of versions of Wild Thing, mm -hmm. and and so many versions of the Angel of the Morning that have been wonderful, including the Nina Simone version and the Paul Flogger from Norway version. Um, so fortunate to have so many great records of those. Of of in in the beginning times when I had my album out called Last Chance, it was the same time Christopherson had his great album out that had Bobby me and Bobby McGee in it and all those guys. So he was around and John Prine had that great John Prine album with Hello in there and Sam Stone and all that. And we were in it together and the nice thing around that, that was that I all of a sudden I was getting some songs from that album recorded by other people. And that made me feel good. And again Murray and Emmy Lou Harris both recorded uh, Son of a Rotten Gambler, which the Hollies did as well. And uh, so that that made me feel really good when that that record was recorded. I love that the way she did that, and uh, and that's the first thing on the album is uh, my tribute to Sun Records, uh, the real thing, which was recorded by Stoney Edwards and Vernon Vernon somebody or other and Johnny Cash and uh, other people. So, uh, it's, yeah, I like those. If I had to pick one, I think. Be hard to pick one. Yeah, I thought it might be a tough question, but I'll just yeah, see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Shall we um, have another one of your, your songs now? We're talking about um, one of the songs from the from your new album, isn't it? Yeah, I, here's I, I I wanted to play this for you. It was just, and to show you how the, the inspiration for mm. it. Uh, it was a couple of years ago, I was in Grand Central Station. And it was pouring rain, and I was fine. I had an umbrella. No, no deal, big deal. There were no taxi cabs whatsoever because it was pouring rain. So I was gonna have to walk eleven blocks in the rain, but I had an umbrella. And if so, it's no big deal. I can do that. Temperature wasn't so bad. I started on my my walk. About uh, two blocks into my walk, I saw. A, uh, an old lady. Now I say old. She probably wasn't as old as me. <laughs> but she was an old black woman, uh, older black woman, trying to get to where she was going, and she was hobbling. And she had a piece of plastic over her head, which wasn't doing her any good at all. So she was getting wet. And I said, I got to catch up to her and give her my umbrella. What the hell do I need my umbrella for? Right? I kept going. She was going really fast. Even though she was hobbling, she was going really fast. And just about when I got a, caught up to her, maybe 20 yards from her, she turned right, and I was going straight to my destination. So I said, oh, well, I headed straight to my thing, and I got about 20 yards down the block, and I said, what the hell? Why am I going to my destination? Why don't I follow her to her destination, give her the umbrella before she gets there? What's the big difference if I go out of my way a block? You know? So I ran back, ran up the hill, got close to her. Just as I got close to her and she could hear me coming, I said, hello, hello. I have the umbrella. She turns into this school and she obviously had safe haven there. And she looked around and looked at me and kind of smiled, you know, and uh, I just nodded my head and 
turned around and lo and behold, a cab. I hadn't seen one cab available. The <laughs> cab stopped right there. Somebody got out. And I got in. And I got my ride home to stay out of the rain. So I, I wrote this song and included that story of the, uh, which is the most important part of the song for me. And uh, the song is called uh, "Whatever Makes." I think it's the big, it's the yeah, from from the brand new album. Uh, with, what is it called? Dad and the Monkey. And uh, I go like it. Whatever makes a mountain tall, whatever makes a human fall, whatever makes a rainbow in an unsuspecting sky, whatever makes a heartbreak star at times human have no heart and I recall we never said goodbye and it's the good side of the good side of us all just remember to remember when you fall. Now here comes this verse that inspired by the lady. Lonely clouds bring raindrops down, falling down all over. It's hard to miss that lonely sound, the crying in the rain. Chase her down, give your umbrella, you'll be one wet, happy fella. Whatever makes the sun come shining. It's the good side of the good side. It's the good side of the good side of us all. Just remember to remember when you fall. There's more to it than that, but that's the part with the woman in it. Mm-hmm. I love that little song. Yeah, it's beautiful, Chip. So where was I? Where were you? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that was beautiful. It's a really sweet song. So was that um did that one come in the same way that the other one did? That you say you had that experience, then did you just come home and um it just come out like that or? Yeah, I guess that yeah. one wrote itself really fast. Uh I I started the second verse with it, it was the verse I had. Then I knew that that I didn't want that to be the second verse. I wanted it to be the first. I mean, I didn't want it to be the first verse. I wanted it to be the second. I don't know why. I just didn't feel it. It felt better if it was coming into the song, not just mm-hmm. the song. And uh, that came very quickly. Yeah, and it's a very simple record. Very simple. And that one's out now, so people can check it out if yeah, they uh, if you like it. If you have, if you get Spotify and you go to my Spotify, you'll see yeah, it's pretty high on my charts, maybe in the fifteen or something like that. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful song. Um, so, so let's move into the next section. Actually, this is where I normally ask my my guests for a songwriting tip. Now we've talked a lot about different tips uh, so far, but is there a particular songwriting tip that you'd pass on, Chip? Uh, well, you know, I I I, I would say. Is that the, what we concentrated on here about silence and about saying something you felt in your own manner? Mm. Don't try to say, I mean, for, I think the best 
writers write from their own manner. It may be a very simple way or simple way of saying something, but they're not trying to write like somebody else. And, and if they get caught, that could be the best thing. If they get caught up in the middle and they don't know where to go, that could be the magic part of the whole song. If you start and all of a sudden you don't know what to say, so you say, you say exactly that. You know, I'm here wanting to say something about you, but I can't find the words. And that's beautiful, right? Yeah. I think couldn't be better. Right? So if you do get stuck and you're in some place, you're not stuck. You just happen to be there in that place and let people know where you are in your song and what you're feeling. And that could be your own magic. It may be my magic. It may be Ben's magic. It could be your magic. And uh, I think that if people can write from their own heart, not trying to impress anybody, but let it be that way of themselves. And they come downstairs after getting edgy and then listen to that little thing that they did. Oh, oh that, that was being real honest there. That makes me feel good. Because being real honest and feeling that inside of you gives you an immense amount of energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. good feelings yeah and your feelings and you can carry you sharing those kind of feelings with other people what could be better if you write a little song that is your own you you said what you wanted to say and didn't say something that you didn't want to say pretty good there it's pretty good yeah I think the magic of that when you know that you've expressed something which is authentic to you and isn't isn't trying to be someone else or trying yeah. to sound a particular way, that when someone else connects with that, that's just such a yeah, I, I such a special true. thing, isn't it? I mean, it's not it's not to say that people don't write in different ways, and mm. some people write in a very cerebral way and get lists of things and try to put them in the songs that they write about, and I think that's okay. I, I don't do it that way. Anyway. My favorite songs, my favorite writers, I think, are people that don't do it that way. Or well, I, I think John Fryan's the kind of writer that writes from the spirit of things. You know, he, uh, he lets the spirit take over. You know. Yeah. So that, that segues us nicely into the, the last section. This is where I normally ask my guests for a song that's meaningful to them in some way related to bereavement. And yeah. um, do you want to tell us about the song you chose, Jim? Yeah, the, the, I, I wasn't sure what to do with John Vines because we did duets on John, very, very important in my life. I, I was, a, I knew John in the early 70s and we did shows together back then and he'd get on stage with me and I'd get on stage with him and those were wonderful times. And then I gave up music to be a professional gambler from, from 1980 to 1996, 97, something like that. And John heard I was back making music and called me on the phone and asked if I wanted to do a show with him. And that was the start of our reuniting our friendship. And I did that show and we'd be together a lot. And he did a duet with me on uh, Black and Blue America, which is the one we were going to play. I don't know if you want to play it the way of it. Uh, uh, and it was always in the, the thing about John is the, um, is he was never like, you never knew exactly where he was going with something. But he always went someplace real honest and real nice and quirky sometimes. <laughs> and he played with words in his songs and he just played with them. Uh, but just in a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, and I miss him. I, I, I really miss him. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I got a song where he helps me out. You know, where I ask him how to get through this day. And, and, uh, like maybe uh, I can't say. I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah. should we hear this one um, from the Black and Blue America album? This yeah, is. Can, um, play, can you play that? Yeah, so I'll I'll put that one in here. So that's this is uh, the way of it, isn't it? The way of it. It's the way of it That's the way it goes Sometimes it rains 
Sometimes it snows Sometimes you're hot Sometimes you're cold Sometimes you're young Most times you're old It's the way of it In this crazy world It's a little boy And it's a little girl To fall in love To have no fear Pretty soon They disappear And it's the way of it You know for some It's an empty dream It's a loaded gun It's a flying stone When you're calling names You think you sound so different Hell, we're all the same And it's, it's the, the way, way of it But some take the chance To walk the walk They even learn to dance And if you dance around With some other kind And you say I love you Hell, we don't mind to Holland just to play for some friends friends, friends are diamonds. diamonds friends, friends are gold. gold sometimes you're young most, most times, times you're old that's the way of that's how it goes sometimes it rains and sometimes, sometimes it blows sometimes you're hot Sometimes you're cold Sometimes you're young Most times <laughs> Sometimes it rains Sometimes it snows Sometimes you're hot Sometimes you're cold Sometimes you're young Most times you're old. That's the way of it. Well, I certainly ain't talking about you and me. I was hoping not. Actually, we have 150 years to go. So we don't have to learn the damn song for for another 100 years. Yeah. It probably won't come out for at least 75. The damn chords are tough. <laughs> oh, you switched it up now. What chords are these? Don't forget the semi-low when you're done with it. What key is this in, anyway? Uh... On the key, I, I know. G. John, this is not in G. It's one of the other How ones. How many rings are there around that tree? That tree looks like it's about a million years old, John. Is that uh, monkey years or dog years? <laughs> How many candles are on that damn cake? <laughs> is it yours or mine? Call the fire department. It's the way of it. Um, brilliant. So that was the way of it. Was that song? Did you write that song, or did you write it together? Or no, I wrote. I, I wrote it myself. Oh yeah. And I thought it would be wonderful that John do a duet with me. And I remember that day in the session where he was trading those funny lines <laughs> at the end of it. We were going back and forth. I forget. I was. Uh, I was saying something about the, this record won't come out for seventy five years. <laughs> he said, "You know, them dog ears or something like that." <laughs> How many candles are on that cake? <laughs> But he, that's John just being John. And that's, and that's the way he wrote. You can just hear him saying things like that. And I guess me too. Uh, we both were like that. You just say things that you say. And, and don't edit yourself so much. Use a lot of silence. And there you go. Maybe you have another wild thing. <laughs> I love it with recordings like that where it just it sounds so natural and you can tell like you sat once scripted that it's just two friends interacting yeah. and it, it's just so nice to hear things like that. Yeah, one of the, uh, the really truthfully 
uh, I loved sitting in the wings watching him play. And because his show was so full of rich things about human beings that weren't perfect, mm -hmm. you know, but were beautiful in his setting. And so to me, going to see a John Fine show uh, it, it was like it was like going to church. So I think if you find on Spotify, you know, mm -hmm. something of John's where he's doing a show. Yeah, I, I just last night I saw him doing something from a couple of years ago in Austin City Limits. And he's doing that song of where he dies and gets to heaven and starts drinking vodka and ginger ale and smoking mile long cigarettes and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, he, it, it, just going to a show, seeing him, made you feel kind of like they did. I did the other night, coming down and hearing my songs, and it made me lifted me up you know, mm -hmm. in a manner, a nice manner, because the songs were nice and they were simple and they were filled with love. And John's whole show is like that. It just lifts you up. You know, it's like going better than going to church. You know, seeing the John Prime show. But, uh, yeah, so he's. I miss him a lot. But he's, he's, thank goodness he is, uh, giving us so, so much wonderful music to hear forever and ever. So. Yeah, that's, that's such a kind of, uh, yeah, that legacy that he's got of his music, and especially for someone like yourself, having all the, the recordings of you together, must be such a nice thing to be able to listen back to and uh, yeah, be reminded of, of that friendship. Yeah, the other song that I had written with him, uh, I don't know if I have it here, uh, it was so much fun to do it. Uh, yeah, I have it. Want me to give you a little bit of an idea? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, John and I, uh, well, we met each other, uh, I'm not sure, eight years ago or something in, in, uh, in Grand Central Station. We were both coming off tour. He was going someplace, and I was just coming in from Sweden. And we had dinner together, the bands, both bands. We loved each other. We were all buddies. And uh, I told John, I said, John, you know, there's, I, there's a girl in Sweden, uh, Jill Johnson, that uh, had a big hit with Angel from Montgomery and a big hit with Angel of the Morning. Those are two her two big hits. And she said, she's a great singer. You'd love to hear her. And he said, why don't we write her another Angel song? We got a third in the trilogy, so we both just thought about that a little bit, and I didn't come up with anything. About four months later, I came up with a little line. I was like, uh, two old friends trying to write a song, <laughs> trying to write a song about some angels, angels on the mountain, angel left in June, 16 angels dancing across the moon. I said, what do you think, John? And I says, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm talking to him. He's in Nashville driving his car. And I'm in New York in my apartment. And I didn't know he was, until later, he told me he was driving his car. So he said, uh, I said, yeah, let's use that line, you know. So, uh, so and then 16 angels dancing across the room. John says on this record, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> I, said, and I said, I don't know. <laughs> but we don't have to know, do we? We're songwriters. <laughs> he says, why did you just take a hike <laughs> and wave that red balloon? <laughs> and there's 16 angels dancing across the moon. <laughs> this is going on in the cars we're driving. And I'm writing this stuff out. So John is great. He said, John says, let's let's make something up about how we pick that number. I said, sounds fine to me, John. Tell me something. What did you do last summer? He said, I spent 16 days in Hollywood looking for a spoon. 16 angels dancing across the moon. Two old friends trying to write a song. <laughs> trying to write a song about some angels. 
Angels on the mountain, angel left in June. Sixteen angels dancing across the room. John said, I got angels in the back seat. I got angels on my hood. I got angels everywhere I go. I must be doing something good. I said, that sounds pretty profound to me, John. Does it fit the tone? <laughs> Sixteen angels dancing across the room. John said, I got enough angels to shake a stick at. Enough to make a grown man croon. Sixteen angels dancing across the room. So I said, hey, John, uh, what are you, where are you writing? He said, in the car. I said, you've been writing this in the car with me all along? He said, yeah. He said, how you been doing? He said, you know that circle up by Music Row in Nashville? I said, yeah. He said, I've been driving round and round that circle for the last <laughs> half hour. <laughs> so that became our, our, uh, our sort of big thing. <laughs> That's brilliant, Chip. But it's, uh, and it's just a great, another great example of what you're saying about just taking those the, the real moments as they are and turning them into into the song. If you can, if you can get a slice <laughs> of what's really going on, during it, and you know, if you can, you're a lucky songwriter because you know you can go through these things where it's going to probably rain out here today, you know. And if you can let that rain be part of you in a nice manner. Somehow, something might good might come of the rain, you know. Um, like the lady that, like the rain that came when I chased the lady with the umbrella, mm -hmm. what a blessing for me, you know. And uh, so, if you can look at things like that, and there's so many nice people, we're we're in Westchester and we're kind of hibernating, but we can walk out and down the street with our mask on, and we won't run into a lot of people, and go down to the store and get some things. In the walk down, we see the nicest people. They're not all over the place, but they're nice people. There's a gardener down there, always there, you know, fixing the flowers. And some people will just whistle as they walk. And it's like, well, it just you see beautiful. If if you're open, if your antenna is open to all that stuff, some something nice will come from it. And, and as you, as you know, if you're maybe sitting in your bed now, not able to feel good about anything, if you started to see something around you that you did make you feel good, some buddy that came in to say hello to you or did it in a nice manner. And, uh, or you can put to somebody that came in as a pain in the ass, and but you can put them in the song too. <laughs> but, uh, you, you get some joy out of being honest with yourself, saying, sharing a few words. And it's nice, Ben, that you do, you take time with these people a little bit and help them. And that's, I could just see your spirit. You're, you're all about that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chip. Um, yeah, it's been, been an absolute honor to talk to you. I've, uh, I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Say, um, say hi to whoever you talk to, whoever you start to write with. And tell them I said hello. I will do, and, and you know, all the stuff you talked about is things that come up a lot in this. A lot of time when I work with people for the first time and never written a song before, they're really worried their song's not going to be good enough. They're not going to have anything to say, and the kind of things that we've been talking about. It's That's whatever, perfect. whatever That's your experience is. That's mm. a good setting. I don't think it's going to be good enough. I don't have much to say. You're the guy I want to write with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. But yeah, thank you so much for your time, Chip. It's been an honor. Okay, then. Nice, and nice thank you for all the all the great music you've given us over the years as well. Thanks a lot, Ben. God bless. Bless you too. Thank you very much, Chip. Bye. Bye now.